as I sit here with you on your couch in your living room. Yeah, welcome. Th- th- thank you and welcome to everyone watching on a very special day, which we'll, we'll get to. But I will describe what, we're, what we have. We have a plate of watermelon, we have a pizza on your lap and we have a half-naked Nico <laughs> wearing a John Mayer next to John Mayer in framed pictures behind us. What the hell is going on? This is not how I typically live my life. This is uh, we've we've just wrapped up a, a little uh, a little shoot that well maybe it'll be out at the time of this uh, this podcast. But we have just wrapped up one of the most hilarious uh, shoots that I've I've ever done. Well, look, I think we think it was that there's definitely a moment in the behind the scenes footage where we really cracked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I'm still kind of trying to get into sort of serious, you know, podcast mode. I'm a business owner, I'm a, I'm a serious man, but I'm still sort of buzzing off the yeah, the hilarious uh the hilarious video we've just shot. And it started with this video obviously started with an idea from you that then turned into a little storyboard mm-hmm. on WhatsApp that you sent me. And why did you send that to me? <laughs> so I'd come up with a concept and I was like I need someone else as part of the other character and I just knew it had to be you. So when I kind of messaged you on on, on WhatsApp, I was I felt like I was um you know mumbling my words and it, the story wasn't coming across as I wanted it because I really wanted you to to say yes and and get involved and and, and really enjoy the concept. I was thinking, "Oh god, I've butchered this." But you were up for it within seconds, uh, which is what I was hoping for. And uh, I think it's it's been well worth it. I've just had so much fun. I think if you could distill a Studio Underdog experience into three hours, this would be the experience where... And describe what just happened, because if you haven't watched the video, you absolutely must watch it. Yeah. But and if, it, if you're also, listening to this and, and not, not watching on the cameras, yeah, I've got a, a box of, I've got a pizza box on my lap as well, which is probably a podcast yeah. first for you. It's quite warm Yeah, <laughs> on, on the lap. It is. But what was the idea? Because I saw this, this little treatment and I immediately thought, this is, I'm going to be part of a Studio Underdog thing. Of course I'm going to do it. Yeah. But wh- where did it come from? Are, are you just, are you messing with people? Is this an, is this another Studio Underdog kind of uh, life hack? What is this? So before I'd even started Studio Underdog, one of the favorite, one of my favorite things about the industry is on April 1st, various brands put together, you know, April Fool's. And I always enjoyed seeing what the different brands would do. And I remember, I think it was the uh, the Seikos that the bezel at one point they did, um, like, was it? Um, they were aligned. Was that the Apple <laughs> no, Nice, nice. No, they were <laughs> Love you, Seiko. ninja stars. I think these huge, big, uh, that was probably, uh, probably some of the jokes in the comments, I'm sure. But I always loved the idea of um, April Fool's projects within the horological space. And it was one of the few places where the Swiss watch industry allowed there to be some play space. Yeah, Once exactly. a year, you were allowed to do something a little out of the ordinary. And I like to take, take that to the extreme. You know, my, my brand in, in, you know, on, on any day that isn't the 1st of April already could be an April Fool's. So I, I like to go in, go in hard on the 1st of April. Um, and I've, I've done projects in the past. So I was thinking, all right, what can I do? Uh, what can I do next? And I had a concept for something that I thought would be quite engaging, quite fun. Um, because my watches are inspired by everyday objects and more often than not at this point by delicacies or, you know, edible, you know, whatever you might have had for lunch. I thought, what could a pizza look like? And there's no way, no matter how good of a designer I might be, there is no way I could make that product look good. Um, and I just thought that would be a, a really funny concept. And I came up with this kind of launch plan and campaign as to what that might look like. And that's what we've, uh, we've just shot. But Richard, you've done this before. <laughs> and it backfired horribly. Yeah, I had to make them. You had to make them. Talk me through that because I'm looking at the aubergine or eggplant now. Yep. So who's to say straight off the bat that this doesn't become some, you know, thousand piece limited edition that the whole world wants more than the watermelon? I, surely no one would want it. Like, <laughs> surely. I mean, to be fair, I did think that about the watermelon watch. I thought it was going to be, you know, me, my mum and two other people that might want something like that. Um, so maybe that's the same with the, the pizza. Maybe there will be huge demand, but I kind of hope not. But I do think... You know, we, we were sitting and chatting earlier and we were talking about the idea of a, a pizza unique. 
And I think that's just too good an opportunity boom, to miss. Boom. Send in the clowns. What a joke. When you told me that, I, I did bend over. <laughs> I actually bent over halfway with from laughter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it has to be done now. I, I think. It uh, does. Yeah. It does. And I think anyone that's to put ourselves into the minds of people that have just been tricked and they've just watched this this pretend watch not go through from the listing listings page, they might be thinking, well, is there a future for the pizza? And there is potentially. But it's so hope, a, hopefully by this time there'll be there'll be plenty of comments, and I think we'll quickly know whether uh, it's a hit or a miss. Uh, so we'll see. Time will tell. We had many puns going in there. Yeah, it was because this this April Fool's Day is coming in hot. It is. Oh, yeah. nice, nice. Now, Richard, on that note, this this is the Great Watch Remix podcast where we talk to people who have helped and been a part of and help me observe the remixing of watch culture because and you have to be in this season one because you continue to just fuck with what is watch culture <laughs> in a i think sometimes in a playful and comedic way and then other times like a couple of days ago with your post where you cancelled a flipper's order in a very real and kind of badass way <laughs> thank you so tell me what do you want to fix about watch culture and what battles are you you know they say pick your battles what mm. battles are you picking because you picked a few big ones yeah so it's surprisingly easy for me to pick my battles because before i started studio underdog and before being an, a brand owner i'm still an enthusiast first you know i remember what it is to yeah and I, and I still do you know and I, and I still you know i still collect other watches and wear other brands and, and and love what other people are doing in the industry so one of the most frustrating experiences is the difficulty of trying to get certain watches and that's not just the big brands that's not just the one you're instantly thinking of when i say that you know it's it's the same uh, <laughs> this one yeah exactly there so you go so i'm holding the 36 mil op uh, frond dial and when i put it here and look at you there's a front you've, you're framed by fronds yeah well there you go <laughs> and that's a great example so let's see even that one in particular you know i've been in the watch space for a while this one i you know i had to go gray market i had to pay you know pay a premium mm -hmm. and it's not fun it's no fun for anyone you know i didn't get why to did you still do it uh just because i you know I, I wanted the i wanted the watch and you love france there's proof in your living room <laughs> it's to be honest the one that's one that i particularly like because again as much of it's a, a really serious watch it's a rolex at the end of the day it's one of their most playful dials you know that's it, so it, true it, to it form kind of, for you it is yeah. just totally on brand for you so to that's, buy that one. that's why i love it um but yeah that that's one example but but even whether it's micro brands or anything it can be a really frustrating experience getting the watch you want and it's no good for the brand side and, and more importantly it's no good from from the enthusiast side so in that example i, ha I had someone uh, that had purchased a watch and they listed it on ebay for sale before uh, before even having received it so it's clear, you know, that that clearly shows that they're not buying it for themselves. It's it's a case of it's purely for profit. If someone buys a watch, they receive it and they don't like it. Fair enough. You know, do do, do what you want. That, that that happens. But before even receiving it, it's it's clear that, that yeah. You felt confident in cancelling that order. Definitely. Yeah. And I and I do it again and I continue to do it. Um, and it means that I can then offer those those watches that are that are cancelled to people that actually want to wear them. I'm going to read out some comments without any editing. And you can see this on, on YouTube. I'm not going to skip. What a champion, geezer, says Smoke and Watches. Well done. Such a great guy to do that, says Tielo79. Clap, clap, clap. Hands, hands, hands. Well done. Show them. Show a lesson, them flippers. Yep, maybe that's a sort of a rap style uh, comment. Fantastic. Love to see it. Awesome. Can't wait to get next round. Finally, fire hands. This guy gets it. Others may now follow. Yes, yes, yes. This guy should be in charge of Rolex. Oh, well, you know. Can we get a scoop? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the first I've heard of it. I do also think I was compared to Jesus as well. So, you know, I don't know oh, what... Jesus, uh... Rich, how many compliments do you need? Oh, I know, I know. There was, there was, a, there was some, some pushback, but, but very little. So, yeah, it's clear that that was something that I was very much just taking my own approach. What would I like to see? How would, as a customer, what experience do I want? 
I've you know made changes to how I sell products as well in general because of that. Um, so a decision like that is fairly easy to make, um, and it's caused a bit of a stir. And it's interesting that no one's ever, like, as far as I know, um, kind of taken that approach and 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 sort of shown people that that's what they're doing. I think that's what people have connected with. Look, I didn't get to the comments, and I was hoping I would, that said something along the, along the lines of, doesn't this guy like making money? And on that note, and you have actually in a messianic moment compared yourself to Jesus, let's, just, <laughs> let's go down that path, Jesus. Why don't you like making money? Because let, let me finish the question. Uh, you may have a ready answer, but you could make a lot more money than you're making at Studio Underdog. You have these pesky principles that seem to rear their beautiful, ugly heads all the time. Why, when so many micro brands would love the chance to have a desirable watch, are you being so difficult? And <laughs> <laughs> that, I've not had that question before, and that's, that's a tough one. So what I'd say is the approach from the very start that made Studio Underdog successful was the fact that I wasn't coming at the industry with an idea of how I can sell the most watches. I wasn't thinking commercially. And exactly as I said at the start, when I introduced the watermelon watch, which is kind of what the brand is known for at the moment, I thought it was going to be a handful of people that wanted a product. Had I followed any kind of guidelines in terms of how to sell more watches, I'd have ended up like a lot of brands do uh, or, or new micro brands that are trying to come onto the market, a sub homage. And so the, from the very start, the intention wasn't how can I make the most money? How can I be commercial? It was just, it was a passion. This is a passion project. Horology, you know, is my hobby. I'm a, you know, as I said, enthusiast before, before a brand owner. And that has led to the success of the brand. So I'm just going to keep following my nose and, uh, and continue along that vein. Um, and, you know, and, and it works, you know, the fact that people sort of enjoy that approach, uh, the fact that maybe that it's kind of a case that I'm slightly more relatable than a lot of other brand owners because, yeah, I'm an enthusiast first. So when you look to the future and I ask you an entrepreneur question, you're a business owner question. How big do you want this to be in five years? Do you and how much do you want this to change your life in terms of this is the thing that then sets you up for the rest of your life. Do you think in those terms? Not so much, no. Um, I mean, it's still fairly fresh. You know, we, we were just saying before we started recording, coming up to the two-year mark. So it's still sort of in its infancy. In terms of five years, I want to be around in five years. And I feel like I'm making the, the right decisions to make sure that I am. You know, it's, it's clear that if the right decisions are, are made, in this space, brands can stay around for a very long time. And I, I want that to be the case. So rather than, I guess, taking the approach of where do I want to be in terms of, you know, financial goals, I want to be here. I want to also be part of the the, the movement, the movement um, of sort of British horology in terms of the, the more... Um, the more work that we can we can do here in the UK. So my watches, you know, they come on a, a, a strap made by David, the strap tailor, British independent company. All the watches are, you know, assembled in the UK. And these are, are steps that are quite challenging to, to put into place. But that's where I see the kind of the future of, of my brand and at least what I want to be doing. Um, so I guess that's in terms of five years. That's kind of, a, I guess, a focus. You are keeping a very tight rein on your brand development, your brand growth. Mm -hmm. Who is your hero in terms of a, a watch brand that you've watched with admiration who has not let the horse bolt or who has not been so controlling as to not let it grow? Because it's a fine balance, isn't it? Well, not, not necessarily you know, not letting it grow because that, that's often a, a secondary factor, but it's got to be uh, Max Booser, MBNF. You know, he's an absolute idol. I've got his one of his books, actually, the, the first 15 years behind you there. I think what he's done is so cool. His approach is, is you know, yeah, is, is unlike anything else. And at the start, he went through the challenges of people kind of saying, you know, really? You know, and he just he just went with his gut. It's, maybe it's just that similar approach that I respect in terms of he wasn't thinking commercially. He He had a vision of what he wanted to do. I just think that is badass.
And if he was sitting on the couch with you now and you had unlimited time, what sorts of things would you really like to dig into and say, Max, I want to understand this deeper. Like, tell me this decision. Oh God, well, the, the first couple of minutes, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd sort of be stumbling over my words and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it's kind of watch royalty there. Um, what would I ask? Um, I'd just love to hear his story from him, especially the early beginnings, the kind of the, the weird and wonderful challenges he faced. Um, you know, the, the people that told him no, you know, that, that, that now are kind of probably telling him, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the early beginnings is, is what I'd love to hear about. And in terms of the equivalency with where you are in a way? Well, I guess so. I, you know, in a way I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't compare because <laughs> it's so, yeah, it's, we're in such different fields. But I, I guess maybe my approach is because of our respect he's done and, and his approach I guess yeah maybe I'm kind of taking cues from him and and seeing what he's doing with his products so hopefully one day there'll be a yeah an MBNF uh, or even a, a mad one on on the table in front of us uh, yeah we'll see amazing now look my favorite Max Busser quote is one that I have on my LinkedIn as my header which is a creative adult is a child who survived <laughs> now the part about watch culture that I consider your remixing at this accessible end because mm -hmm. there is a huge commonality between you and Max Busa, which is your watches as a play space, watches mm -hmm. as, as imagination. If it can be imagined, it can be created. I actually think that's George Bamford saying, so sorry, George, I've, I've pinched that one <laughs> or, or attributed that to Max. But you, to me, the other thing you're doing in watch culture is making it fun and I think Mr. Jones watches is another example. Yeah, you, you must feel a kinship there. But. Yeah, hundred percent. I've, I've I've got one of those that should be on the table in front of us as well. Yeah, the um, the afternoon. What is it? A perfectly useless afternoon. Is that the one on the in the pool? Yeah, yeah. Love that one. Brilliant, brilliant. But that is definitely a part of the way that you're remixing watch culture, which is injecting that fun and that color and that boldness at this uh, price point is that something that is just your personality bursting through or is it something that you felt was lacking that there was a gap in the market for how did I didn't really look at a gap in the market it was very much designing what I wanted and I guess the fact that you know uh, I'm interested in uh, yeah in horology was just designing for me and I like the idea of this sort of juxtaposition of you know, so much of the watch is kind of familiar in terms of the so many, you know, references, 1940s, 1960s, sort of vintage chrono style references, that if you look at the watch from its side or any angle that isn't the dial, you know, the dial side, um, you know, it, it could be a watch from, yeah, from, from that era. And then it's this super modern pop of color, you know, that even going into the sort of dial design, there's various elements that are, um, referencing vintage watches and that's why it kind of feels familiar but it's the color and there's other playful elements that I've added in that then f make it feel modern and, and, and I guess unlike anything else so that was the sort of design challenge and design brief I set myself um, and that's what I find really interesting and I do think that is um, I guess symbolic as as me as a character or as me as a person as it were um, yeah, that kind of a little bit silly, a little bit quirky. Yeah. Now we just mimed and and play acted a scenario where you had writer's block. <laughs> yeah. Has that ever stricken you? Where you thought I I don't know what's next. Um. I guess sometimes, but more so, and it's not quite the same, but it's it's along a similar vein. I've set up this business and I'm now running a, a new business and I'm having to figure out how to run a business. My background is in design and, you know, the, the creative focus approach. So the thing that I'm struggling with now, not necessarily sort of designer's block, but actually finding the time to design. Because when I, you know, when I sit down to design a product, I need no distra distractions. I want to sit down for, you know, a full day sort of, you know, 8 a.m. to midnight and just get in the zone, you know, put on some, you know, some music without What's lyrics. It's, it's often, it's often, it's often house, house music, you know. Yeah. 
Fred again. He's got if, a great boiler room set. If, if this you know. apartment's rocking, don't bother knocking. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just put in music that I can kind of zone into. Often, like without without lyrics, um, which is um, so it's often just a beat. Energy. Just get in the zone. Yeah, and that's actually now more challenging to do because there's so many other elements that I'm having to figure out. You know, I've, you know, pings of emails popping up, so it's difficult to. To, to try and zone out and focus on one thing without thinking, oh God, I've you know got to reply to this customer or oh I need to you know check what's going on on Instagram. That's my challenge. It's definitely the the part of running a small business that is not in the the brochure mm-hmm. or that's not in the when you have this this vision of what it would be like to run a watch brand. You don't have any preparation for the fact that you will be answering emails from disgruntled customers or uh, meeting a DHL guy down the road yeah. and who doesn't turn up on time. And <laughs> it's just your day is filled with, and, and I can say that even at Time and Tide and at About Effing Time, so much of what we do just is always threatened by this tidal wave of admin. Yeah. And the joy is to do what we're doing right now. And this is what I live for in my, my job is to, to have these conversations, but there's just so much annoying train travel and accommodation to be booked and (laughs) all the strikes that we've endured today to get through. And I think it's so for you to summarize, it's not the creative element that's threatened. It's just that sometimes I feel that the creative element is this little flickering flame and it's so easily snuffed out by just Mm -hmm. an an annoying email that that just doesn't go away. It's just a quick quick (laughs) distraction. That's it, you know, and and that can can throw you off, you know, it, it can throw off an entire day or, a, or a, a train of thought that could possibly be leading to, you know, the next thing. So, yeah, exactly. And, and when people ask as well, sort of, what does your average day look like? What is a day in the life? For that very reason, every day is totally different, you know. Um, so, yeah. And lastly, because it, it has been um, a great day today, we, we have filmed a video, we have launched a pretend watch, mm-hmm. <laughs> and now we've done a podcast talking about your your vision and your place in the watch world i wonder what is the the vision for studio underdog that keeps you going forward you've you've given me somewhat of a dry answer which is well i'd just like to be here yeah but what are the moments what are the most elating inspirational parts that just keep you so excited about this unusual unexpected and look anyone that started something in the pandemic and has it still going i mean you're, you're part of the 0.1 mm-hmm. percent but w- what is it about running studio underdog that makes you so passionate because I, when i did just to share an insight when i did get this storyboard from you there was so much thought that had gone into it of course i was never going to say no if it was done in a really offhand way like oh hey andrew i was thinking about this ha 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 i'd be like ha 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 <laughs> and then i'd just get back to my day but you you you're inspired, you're driven, you're meticulous, you're serious. Um, what is pulling you forward? Because I, I want to understand that. I just, I love getting my teeth stuck into that creative side. So, and that creativity spans, expands beyond just the design. You know, it's, you know, I love even just sort of uh, marketing and, and, uh, and these sorts of discussions as well, the film that we've just done. So anything kind of creative, it's like, you know, a, a ball rolling down the hill. It just gathers momentum and, uh, and, and, and continues to grow. That's, that's what I love doing. And I'm, you know, on that, I've kind of, I've been uh, developing a, another watch that is hopefully launching in yeah a couple of months. And that's been another thing where, it's something totally new, something totally different, and I'm excited just to to launch it and talk about it and, and get it out there because it's it is admittedly quite a, a different approach compared to to these chronos. And look, on that note, everyone's a critic mm. when you're a, a watch lover, a watch journalist. You look at AP and you say, ah, one trick pony. <laughs> Try the millinery, failed. Code eleven fifty nine, taking a long time to ignite. You just point your fingers at brands and, and it's everyone's a critic. Mm-hmm. How does it look on the other side when someone says to you, mate, you're a one-trick pony. You're the fruit watch guy. You're the, the funny food watch guy. Good luck breaking out of that mold. Does that intimidate you? Does it how, – how, what is your you, – you're looking very affable right no, now. No, no. It's, it's sort of um, – yeah, no, it doesn't intimidate me at all because – 
because also where a lot of other brands would define the success of an introduction based on, you know, whether it sells or not. <laughs> Honestly, my definition of the kind of the success of the next launch, I already feel like it's a success because I'm happy with it. You know, I feel like it's the next step for Studio Underdog, even if maybe people don't get it or say, well, actually, the first one was better. It's for me, it's the right direction for the brand. For me, it's the successful second album. Even if that second album doesn't sell, it's right for me. Um, and that, yeah, it sounds a bit cliche, but but that is that is the truth. Um, but I'm looking forward to, to getting it out there because, as you said, people think, is this a one trick pony? Is this guy watermelon colors, you know, on a watch? Is that is that just it? And I think there's a lot more to the brand than that. And I think that, you know, there's a lot more stories to tell about Studio Underdog. And I think that the watch that I'm working on tells that story or starts to tell that story, shows what the DNA of the brand is about. I'm sitting here as, say, Max Busser and says... Richard, that's easy for you to say, mate, because you have two years of your life invested in this. This fails, you just clap your hands and walk away. Go on to the thing that you actually were going to do with your life. <laughs> Does that come into it? Because that, for someone, for you to be that blasé and say, well, you know what? I like my, I'm trying to think of a great second album. I like my The Benz, okay. even though it's different from Pablo Honey. Nice. We're in a Radiohead nice. world. Uh, it's radically different. Uh -huh. But you know what? Um, That's I don't what makes care. a good second album. I don't care if you don't like it. It's true. Well, the Benz is a good example of a brand that were boldly going into new territory after the success of Creep. Mm -hmm. Creep is kind of like your watermelon. Yeah, yeah. Would you say? Yeah, good analogy. Yeah. However, over here we have Max Pusser, who since childhood has been fixated on one goal for mm -hmm. their life. So the stakes feel higher for someone that's been invested for longer. Do you agree that that's the case? Quite possibly, yeah, quite possibly. So maybe that's why I'm fairly sort of relaxed about it because it is in its infancy. It's all know? bonus. It's yeah. all bonus round. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, the, the you know, as I said, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm going along for the ride. And, uh, and so far, that has actually helped to sort of perpetuate the success of it. So I'm just going to keep keep doing that. I tried to throw you off your game there. It didn't work. <laughs> but because also I have to say to, to argue against myself, sometimes when something great happens and you adjust to that new reality of, oh, you know, sometimes on Time and Tide or About Effing Time, we have a video that just goes to the moon and yep. we all get used to the moon. We're like, yeah, oh, that's amazing yeah. up here. Fantastic. Three million views this week. Fantastic. I'm, I'm getting used to this. And then when it crashes, you think it's sometimes more devastating than if you spent a whole life building towards yeah. it because you've gotten used to it. But yeah, either that's way, it, but you're I guess very that's comfortable. Why, why sometimes it's a case of, uh, yeah, not necessarily looking at the numbers, just uh, rolling with the punches and, and that, that seems to continue to work. And, and again, it's what, what people seem to enjoy. So, Well, we're going to finish there. And I think as a final message to a fellow micro brand owner who's listening to this thinking, what can I extract from this? To, to guarantee my success or that can help me pave my way to success. What, what are you, what is your distillation? If someone says, Richard, I want to do what you've done. What are the principles that you focus them on? What are the dangers you, you sort of warn them against? What, what's your, your nutshell? So I'd say feedback is good, but too many chefs can spoil the broth. You sometimes just have to, you know, make your own decisions. And if, you know, if, if you've made those decisions for various reasons, go with them. There's only so much, you know, take the advice, take the feedback, but you decide whether you're implementing that. Um, and I think then, you know, in terms of if that's design decisions and, and, and leading to a, to a product at the end of it, you'll be happy with the product. And if, it, you know, if it's successful, you're, you, you know, you know where to go. Whereas if you've taken on, if, if it's designed by committee, it's a lot harder to know what has caused the success or, or what is, is holding you back. So I'd say kind of, um, yeah, decision making, you know, going with your gut um, uh, is, is quite important. And I do think as well, one thing that I definitely had a bit of an advantage on that has helped me hit the ground running is, you know, I've worked with good people. You know, not just in terms of kind of 
uh, the, the marketing. So I've got, you know, John T, who is actually filming, uh, filming here. Um, he's done, he's done a lot of my animations for, for the launch. The well, Desert Sky animation made me hire John T. It was yeah, awesome. Well, they, exactly. And, you know, working with good, talented people, same with that same approach comes down to suppliers as well. You know, before I launched Studio Underdog, I've been to Switzerland. I've seen different factories. I've been to China. I've, I've, I've seen different factories and worked with different suppliers there. So that's, that meant when I was coming up with this idea of launching the brand, I could hit the ground running. And I do think that's really important. So to, to, to end that, I'd say if you can get yourself to fairs, that's quite important. There's, you know, uh, the Hong Kong watch and clock fair that ha happens every September. If you can get there and go there and start meeting people face to face and, and building uh, contacts, connections, networking, that is really important. You can't really just just go on, you know, Alibaba and, and, and start hoping that things are going to click into place. At least that would be my approach. I think that's a little bit bit tough. I'm encouraged, Richard, that there's some work involved because... <laughs> there is some work involved, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly from the outside, someone would look at this two-year sensation of Studio Underdog and just think, that's that I could do the same. But it's there's some hidden... There's yeah I've you know I've I've got experience you know I've, I've been in the the industry sort of working in the industry for for over six years and I've designed anything from uh, you know a, a minions watch that shoots little discs you know to to various fashion watches etc so yeah I've kind of uh, put in the groundwork that's for sure fantastic well Richard thank you for joining us on the Great Watch Remix. Thank you for joining us on the Great Watch Remix podcast. Let's give that a new swing. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a day. And uh, now, if you'll, if you'll humor me, I would like to hear about the five watches that tell your life. We're going to do that in another podcast. Sure. You'll find that somewhere on the channel. Thanks for listening to Time and Tide. Thanks for having me.